Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. We welcome you to this episode of the Retail Focus Podcast. I'm Trent Kling. Coming up on this week's episode... We'll continue our ICSC interview series with Brandon Eisner, Head of Retail Research at CBRE. We talked to Brandon at the conference about a number of things, but most importantly, how technology and investment in technology has affected retail over the past few years and how it will continue to affect retail going forward. McKenna Langley will join us for that interview. In news, we'll talk about a report coming by way of Supermarket News. It's a retailer survey regarding the fresh categories, the parameter categories that have been so important for retailers over the past couple of years. And we'll look ahead to a different CBRE report regarding retail technology, specifically as it pertains to energy savings for retailers. A quick reminder that you can check us out on social media at Retail Podcast on both Instagram and Twitter. Also, this week's episode is brought to you by BAMS. You can visit BAMS.com slash paywell today to start saving on your payment processing. Well, let's get right into that supermarket news study. As we just mentioned last week, Fresh has been a huge driver of increasing sales for multiple major grocery chains last week. We talked about it as far as Kroger is concerned. So this information, super pertinent to retail. Currently, this is Supermarket News' annual Fresh Foods Trends report. We've seen also another push as inflation has accelerated towards preparing foods at home for a lot of shoppers. So some shoppers being a little bit more budget conscious, you're seeing them blow back away from restaurants We've seen this cycle repeat itself several times during COVID, and this is certainly reflected in the report's findings as well. Now, some details as far as where the data comes from. The report is a result of survey responses from 50 retailers and wholesalers. These span all kinds of retailers from chains, independent grocers, and also online pure play retailers. Essentially, the questions were designed to determine the retailers' experiences over the past 12 months, but they did ask multiple questions about expectations for 2022 and the next 12 months, and that was when the survey was conducted in March and April. So we should kind of view these numbers from a wider time horizon. So we're not talking necessarily about things that are going on right now in June 2022, but rather where retailers kind of feel as though things have been over the last year and where things are are headed. Let's start with top line sales. As far as overall sales are concerned, retailers responded favorably regarding the trailing 12 months. 70% of the survey's respondents say sales in parameter categories. So you think of parameter categories like bakery, produce, meat, dairy, floral, prepared foods, deli, all of that stuff has increased over the past 12 months. So 70% of those surveyed say, hey, these categories doing pretty well for us. Only 4% of respondents noted a decrease. The other 26% said sales were roughly the same as they had been over the previous 12 months. So 24 months ago, in essence, increases can obviously be wide ranging. So when you say you have an increase, that could be anywhere from 1% to 50%. So there were follow-up questions asked of retailers to determine exactly how much their sales have increased. 12% of respondents that answered in the 70% that said basically their sales had increased said the increases were over 15% for them, which is quite remarkable. But the largest group of that subset of 70%, so in essence, 25% of the 70% that saw sales increases, said they saw increases between 4 and 6%. This makes sense. That's right where Albertsons and Kroger have been. That's right where Walmart has been rumored to be around, as Walmart doesn't necessarily break things down that clearly on their earnings calls and when they reveal numbers. And keep in mind, this is on top of nearly universal increases in parameter categories during the initial COVID period from spring of 2020 through spring of 2021. 
In general, though, retailers noted that it's still COVID impacts that are driving these increases and not necessarily inflation doing so, although the two are likely intertwined, to be quite honest. The reason for the continued increases in perimeter category sales continues to be COVID-driven impacts, according to retailers. Trends toward healthier eating and away from prepackaged products were also noted as drivers of sales for retailers. And not only have retailers seen increases to this point in perimeter categories, but they do feel as though the increases will keep coming for the rest of 2022 and into 2023. 66% of retailers surveyed said they expect sales in these categories to continue to increase over the next 12 months. Just 9% anticipate a decrease. And as we've talked about, in terms of top-line sales, obviously inflation is going to impact those. If you see inflation in fresh categories from 5 to 10%, obviously if you're selling the same volume of products, it's going to drive your top-line sales up around that 5 to 10%. So you do have inflationary impacts, but we also know from previous surveys, not only with the supermarket news, but in other retail sectors, the convenience store sector certainly comes to mind. Most retailers tend to be pretty conservative in their sales outlook. So the fact that 66% see increasing sales in parameter categories is pretty remarkable. And most of that 66%, around 57% of that 66%, Expect sales during the next 12 months to grow between 4 to 9%. When they were asked a follow-up regarding potential changes to overall product assortment, there were a few different themes in some of those individual answers. But lower-cost products and a focus on core offerings, that was noted as a major mechanism to continue to attract customers despite inflation. Some retailers want to reduce the number of SKUs, actually, as a result and focus kind of more on the best-selling items rather than the fringe products. Part of this also due to continued supply chain issues. A few different retailers noted that, hey, in the current climate, it's difficult enough to get your hands on product, so we just have to focus on our core products and the products that move out the door the quickest. At the same time, some retailers noted the importance of offering more variety, maybe because certain retailers have rolled back their variety a little bit. There was also discussion about larger package sizes for certain products as people continue to seek deals as they buy in bulk. One retailer noted that with greater macro uncertainty, they actually feel as though service deli and bakery could potentially take a hit over the next 12 months, while staple items, milk, bread, eggs, that type of thing will continue to surge as a result of some of that stockpiling behavior learned during the pandemic and certain macro uncertainties that were mentioned during these survey responses included the Ukraine conflict, included inflation, obviously, and also included COVID because that's still going on in the background, although we're seeing a little bit less press about it overall. Retailers were asked where they see the most margin improvement for the survey. They were able to select multiple categories, so a single retailer could select three or four categories, let's say. And so we see here that a number of different areas are really seeing margins improve versus that first COVID year from 2020 to 2021. Over the last 12 months, produce was reported as the leader in margin growth. 51% of respondents in the survey noting margins improved there. Prepared foods, and this is going to be a theme we're going to talk about quite a bit over the course of the survey results. Those saw margin improvements with 49% of retailers. And floral, which, as we talked about last week, was a big Kroger category, that was an answer for 48% of respondents as far as improved margins. But a lot of retailers saw a lot of improved margins across the board. Bakery, deli, dairy, cheese, and meat all were answers for over 40% of respondents as far as margin increases were concerned. At the same time, some retailers struggled to maintain meat, bakery, and dairy margins. 27% of respondents actually said meat and seafood margins fell. 26% of respondents said margins fell for bakery and dairy. So not a lot saying margins are remaining the same in those three categories, meat and seafood, bakery, and dairy. Either you're seeing increases in margins or decreases in margins if you're a retailer. And it's kind of interesting, you wonder which retailers, obviously, 
we don't get that type of information, but you wonder which retailers responded in which direction as far as margins are concerned. So you mentioned prepared foods, seeing margin improvements with 49% of retailers. So if those are a big driver of margin improvements, what do retailers believe is the largest threat to those prepared food sales that they're throwing so many resources at? We've seen some retailers, particularly regional grocers like Publix or Wegmans or HEB, really grow prepared food market share during the pandemic. Well, 40% said more cooking at home was actually the biggest threat to their prepared food sales. And if you're a grocer, that's honestly a great thing. Or if you're a retailer of any sort, since sales would just simply be moving to other in-store departments if that was a concern. 13% said QSRs, 11% said fast casuals, and 6% said convenience stores. In order to retain prepared food sales and prepared food sales market share, 66% of retailers said grab-and-go packaging was crucial. 28% said cleaner ingredient lists. And I found this interesting. 17% actually said plant-based meat alternatives. And in fact, when grocers were asked, or retailers, I should say, were asked at the end of the survey what they thought their biggest win was for them over the past 12 months, some actually said the offering of plant-based meat alternatives in their ready-to-eat section has driven sales in a big way for them. And when you look at perimeter space, the devoted space for prepared foods, well, 48% of retailers said they're devoting more space to those. So you're seeing margin improvements. You're also seeing customers continue to come in, grab those products, and leave suddenly grocers and grocerants to a larger scale becoming a lunchtime destination, especially for customers. And we'll talk about space allocation a little bit further here in a moment. But first, retailers were asked what drives the biggest competitive advantage for them in these parameter categories. No surprise here. Price continues to be king. 51% of retailers said price was their largest competitive advantage. Convenience came next then selection and location. And the reason I think this is pertinent to mention is even just six months ago, there was some thought that convenience could overtake price as the main driver of customer choice. And we were seeing the gap between the two narrow in a lot of customer polls and a lot of customer surveys. I know some surveys, for example, from Deloitte certainly showed that the gap between price and convenience was beginning to shrink in regards to how customers make their decisions. But you see inflation continuing, particularly in parameter categories to a large extent. And so price has been driven right back to the forefront for many consumers, at least according to the retailer's perspective from this survey. Of course, quality and freshness also very important for parameter categories as a whole. Now, 42% of respondents said produce was still the biggest draw for them out of all the fresh categories, although once again, prepared foods came in at 32% too. So basically what we're seeing from this is customers are using produce and prepared foods as decision makers, and they're using price and convenience as decision makers when it comes to the perimeter of the retail store or the perimeter of the grocery store. For context here, 78% of respondents said they had on-site deli staff. Around 66% had customer-facing butchers. So the reason I wanted to include this is not everyone in the survey had prepared foods available for sale. And so obviously they're not going to answer that it's a big draw for customers. You think of stores like Aldi, Trader Joe's, save a lot. Examples of exceptions in these categories. So even for the store's that have a greater focus on prepared foods. Like I mentioned some of those regional grocers earlier, produce still generally seen as the main draw for customers. However, finding associates and qualified associates in the prepared foods area, as well as the produce area, was an issue that many retailers reported. When asked to list their greatest fear for perimeter categories, 32% of respondents said, Training and finding qualified employees was their greatest fear. Supply chain issues came in at 23%. You have to think if that poll was done about a year ago, supply chain issues might have outstripped training qualified employees as that response. And finally, we talked about changing parameter space, giving more space to certain categories. 
And we talked about how more retailers than ever are devoting more space than ever to prepared foods. But there were other categories that saw space growth as well in terms of square footage. 29% of respondents gave more space over the last year to deli. 21% did so to produce and 18% grew their bakery section in terms of square footage. On the other side of things, in terms of shrinking square footage, floral, so that category that Kroger won in their most recent first quarter, and a category that's seeing significant margin growth, actually saw less space in stores, according to respondents. 25% of respondents said they were devoting less square footage to floral versus one year ago. 9% of respondents were giving less space to the bakery, dairy, and deli categories. Overall, though, when you look in aggregate, stores reported giving vastly more space to the perimeter categories, and you're seeing space grow not only in produce, not only in bakery, but in most stores, meat, dairy, overall square footage on average is growing for the retailers that were surveyed. So this is a brief look at least at the larger report, and you can access the full version of that report once again at Supermarket News. Dot com, But it's always a fascinating report, especially given how many sales we've seen driven through perimeter categories over the past two to three years in supermarkets. And because it is a major driver of traffic for these supermarkets, it's always interesting to kind of look at what these surveys are finding in regards to not only how retailers are reacting to consumer sentiment, but also what those consumer sentiments are in the first place. Now, coming up after this break, we'll be joined by Brandon Eisner, once again, head of retail research at CBRE. We talked to him back at ICSC about a month ago in Las Vegas about technology and retail, in particular, technological advancements in retail and investments in technology in retail. We'll also talk about kind of the look ahead as far as shopping centers are concerned over the next year or two years Brandon's always a great guest to have on. We've had him on the show in the past. And so we're excited to profile some of his work in this interview right after this. BAMFs! Are you accepting credit cards in your business? Of course you are if you're a retailer. And if you're not, you definitely should be. But did you know that... Stripe is not your only or best option for payment processing. Get paid well with BAMS. BAMS is a national payment solution provider with automated next day deposits and major savings when compared directly to Stripe, PayPal, and Square. BAMS provides competitive pricing and deposits directly into your bank account in as little as 12 hours. Visit BAMS.com slash paywell. That's BAMS.com slash P-A-Y-W-E-L-L for a limited time and get a $50 Visa gift card after completing your rate analysis to see how much you can save. Visit BAMS.com slash Paywell today to start saving. And as always, that URL is in our show notes. We're happy to continue our interview series here at ICSC in Las Vegas, and we're pleased to be rejoined on the podcast by Brandon Eisner, once again, the America's head of retail research at CBRE. We're going to start out by talking a little bit about a recent retail tech report that CBRE produced called Five Ways Tech Can Assist Retail Occupiers. We'll also talk about some generalized retail trends. Brandon, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Trent. Great to be here. So first of all, this report, I know something that you kind of previewed for us earlier in the year, but just as far as the overarching vision of the report, what was kind of the motivation in putting this report together? Probably the biggest, what started the process is that CBRE does a great job in producing reports based on tech. And we do the Tech 30 report, and then we also do the Scoring Tech Talent report, both of which are heavily read and heavily distributed. But they're focused on the office market. And so what I noticed is that throughout 2021, venture capital flowing into retail and retail focused companies, the levels had really increased year over year. And so I thought, you know, that might be interesting to look into in how tech is, is affecting retail. And it's funny because we don't really talk about that a lot, but you know, obviously e-commerce has been such a 
big changer within retail. And it's generally thought of as a negative against retail, but I think that we're starting to see that actually e-commerce and brick and mortar retail are actually can be really good friends and work together. And so what other ways is tech affecting retail? And so that was the vision behind the report. And of course, one of those extensions of e-commerce is, as it says in the report, m-commerce. What tech innovations and what are some considerations that are going into the mobile space right now for retail companies, especially as it pertains to a lot of these software as a service add-ons? Obviously, one thing that your stores have, your big retailers that have their own apps, I think that's the biggest thing. Your smartphone usage and ownership, it soars, it continues to grow every single year. And so not that this is a new thing, but I think it's becoming a basic thing that it's just a way to engage with people. And you go into a mall and, and you can engage with their Wi-Fi and it can set you up on a wayfinding program or offers can come up and, and you can see what stores have what and what specials are going on. And so it's really a great way to engage with the customer. And it's a great differentiator within retail. E-commerce, we're so familiar with it now, it's almost there's nothing new about it anymore. And so it's, at one point, it's like, oh, this is exciting. We can order everything we want to online. Now, it's almost like the store, that's the interesting new thing. But that said, people aren't going to give up their smartphones. So engaging with people and, and using that more as a tool to connect people with the stores, it, it's a no-brainer. It, it's happening, and it's going to be exciting to see the different ways that we do that from here on out. On a similar note, we're also curious to know how much weight do you put into third-party data resources as it relates to cell phone tracking data on store performance, sales, site visits, and things of the like. It's grown in regard to being looked at as an official source. And I think that it's an absolute necessity to use that type of mobile data. In fact, we have our, our location analytics division here at CBRE, and they've, they've done amazing work regarding finding you know, where retailers should be located and their data. And we actually talk a little bit about this in the report, but their data, a retailer, they can talk to a retailer and find out knowing where their customer base already is online, it, it can be great for these online brands are extending into brick and mortar. So they can find the exact market where they should be, the exact trade area, the exact street where they're on, facing the exact direction of the exact traffic that they want to attract. And so just having that data, retailers didn't have that 10 years ago even. It's just amazing how they can use that mobile data to just really pinpoint exactly where a retailer should be. So I think it's an invaluable tool. And you know, not that census data has no use anymore. Census data is very important, but the mobile data, it's just more up to date and you don't have to wait a year for it. You can tell exactly where you need to be right now. So let's change gears a little bit. One of the things that the report talks about is the importance of technology as it pertains to employee retention. We know that turnover is basically at an all-time high for a lot of retailers that are out there. Retention, training, we've seen some gamification of these things for retailers, but what are some areas in which retailers might be investing as far as making sure they retain employees by using this technology? This part of the report, this is more of an outward looking way, and it's something that people are starting to gauge with a little bit more, but there's been some studies done that show that people want to have tech is a part of their career and they feel that it's a way that it can help define their career. And so industries that have such a high turnover, such as retail trade, if retailers would use that as more of a part of the training process and it's in-store tech, like whereas someone that might have worked in a retail center before 10 years ago, it might have been someone just standing next to a cash register just waiting for guests to come up. But now you can have handheld devices that you can do the point of sale right there, or you can tap into the supply chain with that and say, you know, we might not have this in stock now, but I can deliver this to your house tomorrow. And so it can really just engage the people that work at the store and just make it a little bit more exciting for them as well. And so it, and they can help their clients better that, you know, came to the store. So again, going back to that other point about differentiation, the in-store experience can really be heightened by not only having tech that's focused for the customer, but also that extends the abilities of the people that work in the store. And, you know, maybe that can also demand higher salaries and keep them a happier employee. One of the other things as it pertains to store functionality with tech, and this is a huge topic right now in retail, is shrink. Whether that's, you hear so much about organized crime, also employee theft, employee mistakes. 
what technological advancements or investments are we seeing to try and prevent some of that shrink that we're seeing increasing amounts of from retailers across the country? That's another example of in-store tech and in ways that it can make the people that work in the store more of an active participant within the economics of the store. And let's face it, it is a big problem. And a lot of those issues come from within the return process. The return process online, it's already you know, kind of an issue. It can be a problem where people order a bunch of things online and end up returning 50 to 60, 75% of them. And so when you start using a lot of different channels, so you know, people now can order things online, then return them in store. And there's so many different components to that, that fraud, there's a lot of opportunities for that. And so again, having the employees be a part of, more of a part of the supply chain and understanding where everything comes from you can tag things with you know, codes and you know, QR codes and things that can keep track of the in-store supply and where something else might have come from and something where a return, they know it was ordered online immediately and they're trying to return store. So it can just keep everything more to the forefront and I think keep everything organized. And the thought is, is that that can help cut down on shrink, which it's definitely a big issue within the in-store experience. Another thing the article goes into is how technology is changing lease structures across the board. What are some advantages and disadvantages you've seen from this data? And are landlords using it as leverage on stronger leases? Or exactly have you seen? Yeah, one thing that's kind of happened throughout the pandemic is that tenants and landlords have, it's almost like there's more of a partnership there because there's a lot of help in keeping retailers open. And obviously landlords want that to happen because the opportunity for store closure was very high. And so there's a lot of retailers end up on percentage leases where a percentage of their store sales end up being calculated into the rent. And the technology that with apps and online sales being able to be attributed to a specific store, that's still kind of in early stages. And so that's another place where the more that we're able to develop technology that can have an online sale be attributed to a store that's within a certain parameter, geofencing, things like that, it can make you know, lease negotiations, the information be a little bit more upfront, everything's known, and it, you know, each party doesn't feel like they're at a disadvantage when they're talking in regard to new lease structures. It can be beneficial for everyone and just you know, bring everything more out in the open and just have more agreement in regard to lease and lease structure and whatnot. When we talk about lease and lease structure, oftentimes what happens first, especially for a new lease for a retailer, is they have to find an appropriate spot. And we've seen a lot of technological advances in terms of, we just talked about cell phone data, for example, and and using some of that mobile data. But there are other data advancements as well as far as what retailers are looking at in terms of opening new stores. Generally speaking, at a 30,000 foot view, how have we seen advancements in the process of how a retailer selects their site? Just going back to the advancement of location analytics, it's everything. And I talk with our location analytics team quite a bit because we'll collaborate on projects. And again, just the ability to take it. You'd mentioned mobile commerce data and whatnot. And being able to, first of all, having an idea of where your customers exactly are coming from. Because you can pinpoint you know, who has been on your website, where they latched onto your website from. And you can have a pinpoint map of that and color-coded for density. And so you can know exactly where you want to go immediately. And on that same note that same kind of technology, it can also suggest which stores are overperforming and maybe you need an extra store in that trade area. Or it can also say, you know, that this store is, you know, maybe we, we need to do something here because this is definitely lagging the others. And so maybe it needs to be on a different street or in a different center. Again, it's just the availability of information and it just makes everyone smarter. And it's kind of the same idea of the lease modifications in that when everybody has the best information available, you can make the best decisions possible. And that just goes back to that location analytics data and just the ability to see exactly where your customers are coming from. It's really hard to make a bad decision. And we just, within 2021, in regard to data that I got from CoreSight, that was the first year that had positive store openings since 2017. It was just a small number, but it was a good positive number finally. And maybe that's because a lot of the retailers, they understand now which stores that, you know, where they need to be opening stores and you can be more sure of exactly where to open up a store. So not that we'll never see mass closure of stores again, you can never say never, but the knowledge that they have with locations and being able to score locations in different rankings of, you know, best, medium, worst, there's a lot of different ways to do that. But again, 
retailers should just have so much more information. They can be so much more confident in where they put a store now. So moving away from this particular report, but also moving into what I know a lot of CBRE dabbles in, you've talked about positive store openings in 2021. As we see positive store openings, as we see more mixed-use redevelopments of maybe some space that had gone vacant, we also see occupancy rates rise, and there is less inventory on the market now. What are you seeing just in general as far as overall inventory is concerned for availability for retailers? Trent, I mean, you're exactly right, and that's been a hot topic here at ICSC. And retail availability is that you know, the data, the sources that we use, they go back 10, 15 years, and it's the lowest that I've seen in regard to availability. And it, again, you're 100% right. You mix that also with the relatively muted development pipeline that we've had since 2008, 2009. We've been below average new supply. And in fact, 2020 set a new low in new supply that was beaten the next year by 2021. So we've had two years in a row that they've had the lowest amount of supply. So it's definitely become kind of a landlord's market. And again, we're not talking completely across the board. There's definitely some markets that still have a little bit of reshuffling to do. And But yes, the market is incredibly tight and with construction costs high and a wildly active residential development pipeline. You know, they're building single family homes, they're building single family rental homes, condo towers, apartment towers. It's very active. So not only are retail developers having to contend with higher construction costs, but also they're competing for resources with wildly active residential developers. So development's a really challenge, is a real challenge now. And so this market tightness, I used to be conservative and say, yeah, it'll, it'll go through 2022. But I think, you know, throughout 2023 isn't going out on a limb. I think it's going to get very tight and continue to do so through the next, you know, 18 months. As we stay focused on some of the other macro factors that are out there, of course, from a landlord's perspective, we're also seeing interest rates rise. From a retailer's perspective, we also see inflation rising. So as you look at your outlook for the rest of 2022, what do you see as far as the retail landlord dynamic? So do we have another three hours or four hours? <laughs> That's a conversation that can go on and on. But the one thing that I'll say about retail is it's been incredibly resilient throughout this year. And there's a presentation that I give and you know, I talk about some of the challenges of retail and, and we've touched on some of these already. The retail workforce, there's heavy disruption within the retail workforce. There's all time highs in job openings and in job quits. And then on top of that, the supply chain, there's still a lot of disruption there. There's near all time lows in inventory to sales ratio. And then on top of that, you know, consumer sentiment remains very low, very long term low. I think the last time it was it ticked up a little bit recently, but it was as low as it had been since you know nineteen eighties. And so that said, retail sales continue to grow and people are still going into stores and still buying things. And it's just been incredibly resilient and so far so good. But at some point, inflation may become a factor. I, I, obviously, gas prices are something that affect almost everybody. But discount retailers are still in very aggressive expansion modes. There could be an interesting opportunity for the, the apartment stores that with the economic growth of the last you know, five, 10 years where where 401ks, investment plans have gotten a lot of extra funding and households were very strong financially that might have started tapping into the luxury market. You know, maybe they'll come back to some of the mid-level department stores. And we've actually seen that, that department store sales growth, retail sales growth has been pretty good over the last couple of quarters when you compare to year over year. Maybe that's the answer for inflation. And again, I think people, there's enough choices out there and there's enough different levels of retail out there across all platforms. You know, there's discount grocery stores now. I think that there'll, there'll be something for everyone. And it appears that retail is just going to go ahead and grow anyway, even in the face of inflation and perhaps uncertainty about the future. So we've talked about your outlook and I wanted to close on this. What excites you about the next oh six months or so in retail? What excites you about what we might see out there? Again, the idea of just the recovery, you know, as travel starts to come back and as international travel, you know, hopefully starts to take back. A lot of the markets that are you know, dependent upon tourism have been kind of working hard to engage the people that actually live there in the face of a decline in, in tourism. So that's something that could really be a nice boost for a lot of the markets. You know, the cruise industry is starting to come back full on. And that's been you know, markets that have a vibrant cruise market, cruise line traffic that they'll start coming back. But again, I think it, you know, just looking at it, ICSC, just seeing the people connecting and some of the brokers that I've been working with for over the last two years, I'm meeting them for the first time 
this weekend. So I, I think that maybe this is a little too spiritual for, for ICSE and working for CBRE, but there's a human energy that's between people and going into places where there's activity. And I'm excited to start to see that come back, going into a bookstore and hearing a book open and, and the smell of the pages. And that's what excites me the most. And I'm, I know I'm kind of a hippie that way, but you know, I'm, I'm a local retail person and I still go into stores. I buy very little online, honestly. And Usually the stores I go to, they know who I am. And it's, it's fun to just have those relationships and to know the name of the person that you buy your coffee from in the morning. All that stuff is great. I'm looking forward to return to that even more so. Well, that's a fantastic answer. So I don't think it's too spiritual for ICSC or CBRE, <laughs> either one. I enjoyed that answer a lot. Well, Brandon, once again, thank you for taking the time for the podcast today. We appreciate it. No, this is great. Thanks so much. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. Well, we thank Brandon for joining us. It's always great to have representatives from CBRE on the show. You know, CBRE obviously is an absolute titan when it comes to retail and shopping center services, but... It's important to note that they do a lot of research as well. And Brandon and his folks there do a great job churning out some of that research. And we wanted to kind of stick with that theme because they recently released another retail tech report. This one is entitled Four Ways Tech is Innovating Retail Investment and Development. This is available, of course, on their website, cbre.com. And this report dives into, of course, those four mechanisms through which you're really seeing retailers embrace technology to change things. Among them include site build-out, engagement, and the metaverse, but specifically, we're going to talk about the energy facet of things as it pertains to not only site build-outs, but also going back and retrofitting certain retail buildings. And we found this was an interesting topic because, as we talked about with Brandon just now, there are relatively few build-outs as compared with 10 years ago. Those that are taking place are increasingly seeking energy conservation, but you're also seeing a number of renovations, both for retailers and landlords, that are maybe refurbishing some older properties such that they can achieve that final energy conservation. And of course, this is a good business practice in general, but also energy costs have increased pretty dramatically The study from CBRE notes an increase of 35% in terms of energy costs for the trailing 12 months at the end of May. So really, the whole point to this looking ahead segment, you begin to wonder if retailers will begin to demand more energy conscious spaces from landlords, how they'll be working with shopping centers to kind of attain these spaces. Energy costs in retail are almost always passed on to the retailer either through cams, so maybe the landlord is the one that's paying for the energy costs and they will go ahead and pass that on to the retailer through the common area maintenance payments that the retailer then will remit the landlord, or the retailer may be charged those energy costs through direct billing. And either way, the retailer is going to be paying in some way, somehow, for energy there. And ultimately, there's a lot of different technologies mentioned by this report 5G connections were mentioned certainly is something that has the capability of really decreasing energy usage in certain areas of the store, but there were other things mentioned as well. Smart thermostats, a no-brainer option for a lot of retailers as far as HVAC systems are concerned. But one of the things that the report talked about was the ability of the smart plug in terms of plug load to potentially save energy up to 50 to 60% throughout the course of a retail store surrounding those plugs. Lighting, we've seen a lot of retailers, particularly Target, invest in lighting, but also Walmart as well has invested in lighting. And you're seeing potentially 20 to 30% savings there. Window shading was something that was mentioned in this survey as well through smart glass technology that could be saving energy and, of course, building automation as a whole. So between 5G connections, which are expected to rise, in fact, over 500 million 5G connections are expected in North America by 2026. You're also seeing some of that smart technology, some of the technology that can operate using motion sensors and the like. Also, 
You're seeing geofencing, which is another thing that Brandon mentioned during the course of the interview. So really what I want to look forward to is how many retailers will be jumping on the energy savings train. We've had interviews on the show in the past that discuss outdoor lighting, interior lighting for retailers. We've had interviews that discuss even refrigeration for retailers. But especially if you're a grocer, there are a lot of energy costs that are kind of wrapped up in simple day-to-day operation. And it's incumbent upon retailers not only for, let's say, the good of the planet, but also for their bottom line to ensure that they're making smart investments. Retailers are always looking to see if the cost of these investments might be outweighed by the simple cost of paying for the electricity month after month. Well, with these energy costs rising, you'd have to think we're going to start to see some of this technology pop up in additional stores away from just those A-class shopping centers, away from some of those new builds. And you're going to see retailers, perhaps beyond the Walmarts and Targets and Kroger's of the world, really make investments as it pertains to energy efficiency. So that's what I'm looking ahead to really over the next 12 to 24 months. How many of these projects get put into the pipeline? How much CapEx from retailers flows towards energy efficiency? And how much CapEx from REITs and landlords can we expect to go towards energy efficiency to try and attract tenants on that basis? It's a very dynamic space, obviously, and we're looking forward to future interviews on the topic as energy costs continue to rise with really no potential end in sight that we've been given. So that'll do it for this edition of the Retail Focus podcast. Once again, a big thank you to BAMS for bringing you this week's episode. You can visit BAMS.com slash paywell for a limited time and get a $50 Visa gift card after completing your rate analysis to see how much you can save. We also thank Brandon for joining us here on the show this week. Coming up next week, we'll be joined by Whitney Livingston as we continue our ICSC interview series. She is the President and Chief Operating Officer at Centennial. She will discuss retail mixed-use development, something we've heard so much about over the last couple of years. She'll talk about site identification for potential redevelopments for mixed-use and how you come up with the appropriate mix in the mixed-use between residential and commercial, retail, all of that stuff. So really looking forward to being joined by Whitney on next week's episode. Thanks to McKenna Langley and Leighton Kling for helping out behind the scenes. I'm Trent Kling saying so long until next week. This has been the Retail Focus Podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.